you're hearing me? Good, excellent. Okay. Uh, yeah. All right, let's get going. Uh, so, hi everyone, I'm Aapo Alasuutari. Um, yes, that works. Um, as said, I work at Valmet Automation. Uh, so, I have this wonderful title, Chief Design Engineer. It sounds great. We have like 20 of those. Um, I, I'm working with th this uh, user interface. You can see a bit of it that up in uh, the top right corner. It's a, a, a DCS or automation system, distributed control system user interface, and it's uh, currently running on customer sites all over the world, running Chrome browser, um, and in the future will support other browsers as well. Uh, I also freelance at Dino Land Inc., so Dino where uh, some others here as we work as well. Um, a user interface, like it's, it's at least ours, it's not exceedingly performance critical, right? Like it's nice that it's fast, but it's not like it needs to crunch numbers in some nanoseconds. But poor animation performance, for instance, is something that really, really quickly hurts us. And unfortunately, actually, Chrome is, like I'm not, I'm not throwing rocks here, but Chrome is a bit underwhelming here. Uh, see, for instance, the Hummingbird HTML render, this is a, an HTML render, kind of like a, a low-level or small-ish browser by Coherent Labs. They, as far as I can tell, built this whole thing just because Chrome's animation performance was not enough for them uh, in games. Uh, so, okay, what is Nova? Nova Engine uh, started with Andrew Botea's uh, joke in Dino's Discord. So, when are we starting our own JavaScript engine? And we did. Uh, then it laid low for about a year until about a year ago I heard about data-oriented design, which is the th thing um, underlying the Hummingbird HTML renderer as well. So, here's the um, kind of arc where we get from Valmet Automation to um, Nova Engine and then here. Um, and I, I thought like, wow, like this data-oriented design, entity component systems, that sounds really interesting. How would it work in a JavaScript engine? What would it look like? So, okay, first of all, what the heck is data-oriented design? Um, the first, the ultimate rule is know your data and how it is used. Uh, there's nothing more to it. Like this is not some uh, great overarching design principles system where where you know this is how you build your systems. You you make them out of nice cars and whatnot. No, not like this is just you need to know your data. If you don't know your data, you don't know your problem. If you don't know your problem, you can't solve your problem. Um, and once you know your data and how it is used then you can start designing your solution. You need to design your data, uh, data structures for the most common use case, not for like the, the overarching, this is everything that can ever happen. No, that's, that's useless. Design for the common cases. Your program, when it runs, it does not touch one thing once. It does not touch everything once. It touches some things many, many times over in a particular order, in particular ways. Um, loops, iterations, algorithms, those are the majority of what your program does. So you need to think in these multiples. If you're, if you're looking at a single thing, um, you are just, you're wasting your time. In the multiple cases, in the common cases, you need to be optimizing for cache line usage. That's basically where performance of computers or programs, in a way, drop um, crashes and burns most of the time. Um, so ignore the singular case. If this is something that happens once, it does not matter. Like, does it, does it take 400 nanoseconds, 2 milliseconds? The user is not going to see or care. It happens once. So uh, what does this actually mean? Here's uh, what a cache line in no, uh, node 18 looks like when you have eight or, or multiple objects in an array created at the same time, each of them having two named properties. First, there's the prototype or actually the shape pointer. Then there's the elements pointer, properties pointer, the first pro, uh, property in, in line in the object, then the second property in line in the object, and then uh, the next object starts 
right after the other. Um, looks nice, kind of cool. Uh, so here we can kind of think how quick is it to get to the, the first in, in object property out of this. What's the answer? Anyone want to say? Um, well, uh, that would be one way, yeah. Uh, the answer is first, about 200 nanoseconds. The second answer is it doesn't matter. It's a, it's a single thing. Don't think about the single thing. Um, the, uh, your computer loads data, not byte by byte, but in cache lines. So 64 bytes, that's 64 uh, elements there, or 64 boxes. That's a single cache line. Um, when we want to get the P0, we need to read the prototype uh, because we need to make sure that this is an object which has the property that we're actually looking for. And we need to get the P0. Everything else here is wasted. We're not taking the elements or using the elements. We're not using the properties. We're not using P1. And we're most especially not using the second property, uh, so, sorry, the second object. Uh, but this is a single off. We, we don't care. This is what we should be thinking about. If we're mapping over an array of these objects and we're taking every P0 out of them, how quick is that? Now we're thinking in multiples. Now, now this actually matters. And this is how I would do it. Um, instead of having all of the stuff in a single cache line, kind of right next to each other, have multiple cache lines, have multiple vectors, where one vector contains the prototype pointers of each object, one after the other. Another cache line contains elements pointers, another contains properties pointers, and then there's some place where you store the uh, proper uh, properties. Now, how quick is it to load uh, or map eight of these? Well, we still need the um, uh, prototype pointer, so we take the first cache line. We also need the properties pointer now because there's no in-object uh, memory. So we need to uh, load the third cache line. And then once we get that, we can start loading the fourth cache line there. So that's uh, loading three cache lines. The first two is prob are probably going to be loaded in parallel. So that's 200 nanoseconds. The third one needs to be loaded in sequence. Uh, but once we get that, we actually get the whole thing. Um, and we will need to load one additional cache line to get the uh, properties of object five, six, seven, so on. But now we've loaded four cache lines, we got all the data we wanted. Um, that's nice. We can you know, map all of this stuff kind of very quickly. So OK, data-oriented design gives us improved cache line usage. But what does it actually cost? Like, of course, there are trade-offs. Well, obviously, uh, an object is no longer just a pointer, right? How on earth would we have a single pointer that points to this cache line and that cache line and that cache line, uh, like here we saw. Like, how do you point to the first item there? It's it's three different pointers. Well, it cannot be a pointer, but it can be an index. If we have parallel vectors, one vector of the prototype pointers, one vector of element pointers, so on and so forth. Now your object can be an index. The zeroth index of all of these vectors contains the data for this object. Um, but if you're using vectors, then it means that your heap data, the data that they contain, it must all be the same size. We're not doing het heterogeneous vectors here. That would be horrible. Um, so either each object, its heap data, needs to be as big as the biggest can ever be. And now that's very big. Or you need to have multiple different vectors that you somehow know which one you're going to look into. So this basically means each exotic object in the JavaScript spec gets its own vector. And that gives us some nice benefits in a bit. One thing that this also means, if you do, how many of you have done V8 or know V8 uh, somewhat intimately? Like two people. Um, uh, V8 has embedder slots. I don't know if, uh, if Spider Monkey also ha has embedder slots. That's not really a thing uh, because, like, you either you would need to have an embedder slot in every object always or prepare for them. 
so you're wasting memory most of the time, or you just say, like, we don't have them, so we don't have them. Now, your value then becomes a tagged union. Uh, it contains a tag and then the index. That tag tells us which vector are we going to look into, and then the index, of course, tells you the index in the vector. Or, of course, you can also have, like, and a tag that says this is stack data. And in our engine currently, the value is 64 bit, uh, bits in size. Um, we could take it down to 32 bits, but that would mean that we can all only have 16.7 million uh, objects, for instance, alive at the same time. Um, yeah. So, okay. We get, with this, we get better cache line usage. Do we get anything else? Is, th is, this, is? Uh, is this it? Well, no. Um, we only kind of so far optimized the cache line usage. We didn't really think about the common cases yet. If you have an array in JavaScript, you are not going to be reassigning its prototype most of the time. You're, you're also not going to be assigning any named properties uh, to it most of the time. All of that is not needed. We can throw it out. Array buffer, data view, things like this, um, you, you don't need prototype, you don't need pro properties, you need, don't need elements. You need nothing. Like, these should mostly be just marker objects, and s uh, that's the main point that they have. Of course, there's the in interesting data somewhere back there. But So, an array, as an example in Nova, looks about like this. We have an object index there, which it's not quite this actually in the engine, but it should be. It's either a backing object, so that's an index into the object of vectors, or it's a realm, which is again an index into the vector of realms. And that says either I already have a backing object and it's there, or I was created in this particular realm, so if you need to create a backing object, then you will use that realm's uh, uh, um, intrinsic objects. And then there's the element, which is, uh, it's a 12-byte data structure that tells us which element vector to look into and at what index and so on. Um, now, if we minimize this uh, and split it, we can get it to be four bytes uh, for the backing objects in a single vector, and then eight bytes for the elements in another vector, th two parallel vectors, and now our array Maybe our first array would be array zero, so we take the zeroth index in both vectors, and there we find the data. We have the object index and we have the elements. And now, if you're taking like the zeroth uh, element of this array, you never need to even load the backing object or the object index. You don't you don't care about the prototype or anything in an array when you're taking the zeroth index, unless there is no item there. Then you need to go to the prototype chain, but you know that rarely happens. So common a case is to access the elements or the length, so optimize for that. Um, pessimize the prototype lookup, pessimize properties, like named properties, um, because that's not going to happen. And optimize for m mapping over multiple of these, so put them on the same cache line um, in a vector. And yeah, as I said, so we can get like uh, eight element pointer pointers on a single cache line if we really kind of optimize this down. Um, and the elements themselves also, also live in heap vectors. They look like that. And there's a value which is a vector of options of ar arrays of a given size of options of values. Uh, it's a bit of a mouthful. But what is interesting is that um, the descriptors, so that which says, you know, is this writable, readable, uh, sorry, writable, configurable, so on and so forth, that stuff is all in a hash map, so a um, we could call that a um, sparse vector in a way. Only if you are setting some proper uh, descriptors, like uncommon descriptors on an element, only then will we create this hash map for you. If you're not doing it, we're not going to create it. It's just not useful. I think that's this is probably what every e engine basically does. So, like preaching to the choir here, but you know, still. Um, so, okay, we get improved cache line usage, but obviously that's not going to help if your items are 
spread over multiple cache lines. So what does, what's the point? Well, uh, GEC systems, the first axiom of why we even do GEC is that most objects die young, right? I have a corollary. Most objects live together. If you have, if you have a single item, it doesn't matter where it is. If you have a hundred items, now that, that kind of matters. Um, and a hundred items, I, would, I could kind of see a human being creating a list of hundred items with drag and dropping and so on and so forth. And then you could end up in a situation where the elements in that array are created at different times. But if, it, if it's an array of a thousand items, a million items, now you're actually really caring about where those, those need to be right next to each other. But a human being will never create an array of a million items. A, an array of a million items has come from JSON pars. It's going to be created all at the same time, right next to each other. Um, so we just need to make sure that they stay together. So we put our heap data in a vector of items T. And now we just need to make sure that we're not messing about, we're not changing order. So when we do GC, we drain the vector of items that are no longer reachable, and we shift all other items down. That's a hell of a lot of copying of data, so this might be like really slow. We'll see wha how this works, but uh. um, but as a consequence of this, the vectors are always packed. Um, any items that were created roughly at the same time, if they're still alive, they will be right next to each other. Um, mapping, uh, mapping through a vector or array of items will usually map through a linear memory. Data that was created together stays together. Of course, this means that all of our references in the heap, all the indexes, um, need to be realigned on GC. But uh, as a small mercy, this is actually kind of really simple. Like, uh, it's not really v that complicated to figure out how many, uh, like, uh, how much do I need to uh, take out of this number. And it's still like just, it's a single calculation, um, more or less. So with this, the heap doesn't really fragment over time. Of course, uh, human interaction can create fragmented things, but uh, it's mostly on a very small scale. And as a nice benefit, actually, from this, uh, we get nursery for, for free, kind of. If we've GC'd this particular vector down to 100 elements, and then somebody allocates two, 100 elements more, we know that, or we can kind of decide that, okay, any references, any assignments to items below the 100, those are going into old space. And now we just mark that, okay, this, this particular element is now reachable from the old space and so on. Um, we don't need to re redo the whole GC. So minor GC can be done. Um, okay, so in conclusion, upsides. Uh, we get excellent cache line usage, or at least the potential for it, uh, especially considering that this is a dynamically typed language. Um, the vector-based heap is actually kind of surprisingly simple to reason about. And it, uh, it really gives us some interesting opportunities. And the tagged union uh, value is really nice because it has no pointer shenanigans whatsoever. Uh, you give, I give you a value and you're, you're a very bad person. You put it somewhere here and then you're going to like later on follow this pointer to find my heap and do nasty things. Well, you can't. It's not a pointer. It does not point to anything. It's an index. Uh, and also type confusion attacks kind of aren't really a thing here. Like you can take, you, if you take your value and you change the tag, it does change the type, but it also changes where it points to at the same time. You can't take an array buffer and say this is a shared array buffer and now do nasty things. No, it, like if you say it's a shared array buffer, now it's pointing to data of a shared array buffer. It, you can still do kind of nasty things for the memory of that, but you can't um, turn an array buffer into shared. And of course, the 64-bit integer value that we currently have gets us quite a bit of heat stack data. So we can actually represent all of JavaScript 
integers on the stack um, kind of safely uh, and a bit more and up to seven characters of uh, small string optimization which is kind of nice as well um, and properly exotic objects so functions data views array buffers so on they have this really nice uh, time of uh, or really easy time of separating their concerns from the general object concerns because they just have that backing object pointer or index they don't need to know anything more than that um, but there are downsides there are downsides it's all about um, trade-offs I've heard that's a thing so if we pessimize the odd cases it does pessimize them of course um, our objects do not have any elements S all properties in an object are just properties so if you assign zero to your object it's not going to this special elements array it's going to the properties and it's going to be the last property there because I can't be asked to re um, reassemble your properties list so if you do object keys on this then I will need to check that you don't have any uh, indexed properties there before I give you the object keys list and uh, like of course if somebody's doing like their own array like object it's gonna be slow um, arrays with named properties uh, need that extra indirection like if you're putting named properties in in an array or array buffer they're going to the backing object and not to the array itself uh, special internal slots say uh, the promise resolving functions or anything for that matter and shared ownership of internal data uh, structures those all kind of force us to either pessimize the common case by adding support for this adding the possibility of having this or we need to add yet another heap vector we have a lot of those um, so promise resolving functions re rejecting functions if we want to prepare for these then all built-in functions would need to kind of prepare for maybe possibly being a uh, promise resolving function even though there will basically never be um, either that or we have a special heap vector of promise resolving functions and the value also knows like I, I can be a promise resolving va uh, function oh, that's, that's an interesting value um, promise capability records uh, these are um, shared between modules and promises and so on and so forth uh, so either these need to be reference counted pointers or it's yet another heap vector and now the uh, items then of course have this index into this heap vector uh, of course that's what we choose uh, and each exotic object each different kind of object we add to the engine requires its own implementation of the internal methods because the backing object is going to be or the heap data is going to look a little different each time so it needs to be a different function so this is actually kind of a, a very bad thing in a way because code is also data all although we kind of get some benefit from um, having very um, monomorphic functions we do have a lot of them and it you know you kind of need you're polluting your cache instruction cache with that so we don't have inheritance we, we the heap data access is always different so the uh, implementations they all look really similar but they're different and of course the the GC really remains to be proven like uh, half space copying GCs are a thing so I'm not really too worried about thi this I think this is gonna work uh, but it could also be that it just does not and of course as the heap size go grows then this just gets worse and worse but of course that's the thing for every GC yeah. that's the official part I also have bonus slides if nobody has questions but now QA and also uh, if there's more interest in the topic of like data oriented design or JavaScript engine uh, or Nova uh, we can also organize a an informal or explicit breakout session later on the week all right great job do we have questions
Uh, hi, I'm curious about how much performance benchmarking you've done and what you've what kind of benchmark suites you've used for that. Well, absolutely none. Um, so uh, I'll actually actually show this. So this is where we're at currently. We have uh, about three percent of uh, test two six two passing. Six six. We're, we've doubled. Ah. Yeah, so, so the parser actually uses uh, OXE, which is uh, uh, like uh, the parser for our transpiler. And uh, that means that a lot of the test six to uh, tests we, we get passing by default. It also means that we, uh, we have six, over 60% crashes because we, uh, we get an AST that we then can't use because we don't implement a lot of it. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah, so th this is... This is like active development uh, and more like, um, let's see if, if any of this makes any sense. Um, the, the more like, per, as I was saying, I was saying about the like 200 nanoseconds and so on, that's just the like ballpark estimate of, of what a cache line read, uh, cold cache line read requires. Yeah. There are questions here at least. I was wondering about objects that have many, many, many references. Um, probably not a very unusual case in a code base that you have some singleton or uh, uh, semi-singleton that might be referenced by, I don't know, <laughs> maybe tens of thousands of, mm. o of places just because uh, the, the coders are using a framework, yeah. and uh, it, it's somewhere in the class hierarchy, so it's always there. Um, those kinds of objects pose a problem for the little uh, the fragmentation algorithm you have proposed, and I assume that the current mitigation is that those objects would uh, soon be promoted to the old um, uh, old heap um, so there is actually like so th there is no separation between old and new uh, the uh, I was actually kind of theorizing that um, if you find that you're not collecting enough stuff um, but you you're also not kind of creating too much garbage you can actually just lower your uh, new space index because it's everything is in the same vector and now you're Ooh. you just have uh, like every object or every backing object is in the same vector and now this index here says anything here is new anything here is old now if you have a uh, let's say you create a class um, that is then used very frequently and it stays it basically st stays alive until the end of the program. Now it will slowly start moving towards the old space side. Um, but yeah, like that's kind of a, it's kind of a problem, but also, well, we, we'll, we'll see, yeah. Uh, gar garbage collection is not my area, but I don't know, that, that sounds like it could very much be a problem when you run it on an application that has a lot of data, like those that were visualizing data earlier, those can get uh, uh, ginormous heaps. Mm. And if, if you only have one heap and you have to move everything, I don't know, that, 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 that to me is concerning because yes, it might be an embarrass uh, embarrassingly parallel problem, but you might uh, still have to do it over eight gigabytes of data. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's it's definitely a possibility that it ends up being like kind of totally unworkable. Um, then the mitigation would maybe be that uh, if if at all you can uh, do it, then you will instead of doing a major GC, you will slowly uh, just take more. You you will lower your index, um, so you're constantly doing parallel minor GCs. Um, <laughs> you ha you do have a <laughs> stop the world at the end, um, but you're kind of 
you're never GCing the whole heap, you're GCing the top part, and then you move down a bit, you GC this part, and so on and so forth. Uh, it's kind of I was thinking much simpler things, like having some kind of virtual index, so that uh, uh, um, you can have things working with some small table, in some cases, without having to do a full defrag. I don't know. Mm. We'll see. <laughs> we'll see. We'll yeah. see. I, I, I'm, I'm curious how it will go. There's I saw one more hand. Uh, I have two questions, if I may. Yeah. Uh, one is, have you thought about giving this talk to TC39? Um, well, I am in Finland next week, so uh, I could, um, but not particularly, no. I think there's even still space on the agenda. Yeah. Um, second question, so you mentioned no embedder slots. Um, I imagine that embedding is not a big concern for you right now. Yeah, nothing is really a big concern. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, another bonus slide. Oh. <laughs> it is our I order of importance. Uh, we've done the first part. Um, I am slightly interested uh, in Valmet. We have we do a lot of embedding stuff there, uh, and we do have some use, some possible use cases for a simpler JavaScript engine. Um, embeddable JavaScript engine that can be kind of feature flagged to drop out uh, all the unnecessary complexity that you never use. Um, and so em embedded is, is kind of a thing, but uh, embedder slots are still like, we, the engine currently has a, a kind of get out of jail free card where you can say, you can create embedder objects, which are then, or, or you could, if we implement it then, then, but that would be like the place where you go to when, when you need a special kind of object. Okay, so if I was an embedder, like I would create one of these objects that would live in its own heap vector, and then it would have like a weak map inside it for uh, storing data? Or yeah, something like that, or um, not current, not really kind of fully fleshed out yet, but uh, there's a v heap, op uh, heap vector for dynamic, like a, a V table plus the data, or, or actually V table plus the pointer to the data of this embedder object. Okay. And, and yeah, you would then get kind of your, you could do your own um, object as you want it, have all the internal slots you want and so on. Okay. And of course have the own, own internal methods for get set, what, what not. So while you were talking, I was trying to figure out how that might work. And uh, like, would I be able to, uh, like if I didn't want to use this escape hatch, would I be able to get like my own vectors uh, if I eventually? I, I've been thinking about that. And uh, currently what really blocks that uh, first and foremost is that Rust, w this is written in Rust, Rust doesn't have um, a dynamic number of generic arguments. So it would be kind of really cool if I, if I could say to the, or y if you as an embedder could say to the engine, um, I will have 10 different um, uh, embedder objects these are the types for them, or the, uh, the traits for them, yeah, types for them. And now the engine would create those 10 vectors. Uh, that would be really cool, but I and it's possible to do, but it re would require some uh, annoying macro things and basically just like pumping out implementations for one, two, three, four, five, so on and so forth, uh, uh, different object types. Cool. Nice. Thank you, Apo. Um, it's lunchtime now. Oh. <laughs> so we will resume after lunch. And if you have questions, please feel free to reach out to Apo later.